Welcome to the Donor Education Series being hosted by Missoula Community Foundation. The foundation works to be a connector, educator, and funder in Missoula. The foundation's most recent expansion has been their ability to manage funds, including donor advised funds that we're going to talk about today. My name is Kirsten Martin. I'm the AmeriCorps Vista working at the Missoula Community Foundation. Our mission is to enhance community vitality by inspiring community giving and strengthening nonprofits. We hope that this education series serves to increase awareness about philanthropy in our community. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Marcy Allen, our executive director, who'll be talking to you today to you today about the differences between donor advised funds and private family foundations. Marcy is a connector, a strategist and community builder and a believer in people in place. Her secret superpower is connecting the dots between people, ideas and systems for the last systems. For the last 18 years, she has built organizations from the ground up and helped others with the resources to do the same. Working in economic development has provided her a deep understanding of community issues, resources and people. She believes that we all rise together. She oversees day-to-day -day operations and is responsible for translating broad objectives set by the board of directors into specific plans for the achievement of immediate goals. Marcy loves to embrace change and believes that real organizational change comes from a place of understanding. Now, I'll pass it over to Marcy. Thanks everyone for coming today. I'm really excited to have you all here. Um, the fact that you're sitting here in this room um, you know, is that you are a giver and you're interested in giving back to our community. So um, welcome. And um, today's conversation really is about the difference between um, family foundations and donor advised funds. And we will, um, I want to set the stage and build the foundation for this presentation with a few just definitions of some of the things that we'll be discussing today. Um, so what is a family foundation? A private foundation, um, it's an independent legal ed entity set up for solely charitable purposes. Um, funding for family foundations typically comes from either an individual or maybe it's um, multiple family members um, pooling assets. For instance, the Rockefeller Foundation typically has, um, well, there's multiple family foundations and each generation has their own with their own focus and interest. Um, it can also be um, funded um, with a corporation and it receives um, tax deductions for the donations. Um, those individuals receive tax donations for their deductions or for their donations into the um, foundation. Um, and what is a community foundation? Um, a community foundation is a unique um, public charity um, that is dedicated to improving the lives of people in a defined geographic location. While the Missoula Community Foundation can um, donate um, across the country, um, we are focused on benefiting the greater Missoula community. And our funding comes from public support of the foundation. And what is a donor advised fund? It's an, I like to think of it as an irrevocable giving account. Um, the donor, um, receives charitable tax deductions for contributions into the fund, and then can make um, grant recommendations um, to fund charitable organizations, um, either within that same year or um, as long as the, the fund has assets in the, in the years um, after um, that first contribution. And a donor advice fund can also be endowed. Um, I wanna do a quick poll. Um, how many of you are aware of the endowment tax credit? Okay, we have a little bit of both. So that's exciting. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, okay, so what is an endowment? Um, an endowment is an established fund. Um, it's designed to keep the principal corpus um, intact. Um, and the way that it serves the community in perpetuity is by the investments. As that money grows, it distributes grants from those um, uh, 
returns. And then some of that money is actually put back into the fund to continue to grow it over time. Um, a great example of this um, that I love um, that was recently in the New York Times is um, the Franklin Fund. Um, ben Franklin um, gifted um, 2,000 sterling to both um, the cities of Boston and Philadelphia. And um, in the, the stipulation with the gift was that they had to um, just invest that money for 200 years and they couldn't touch it. And so those funds, that gift today, which um, 2,000 2, sterling was about $60,000 in today's dollars. And that money today is worth $6.5 million in funds all kinds of activities in both Philadelphia and Boston. So that's a pretty good, cool story. Um, and endowments give in perpetuity, so they give forever. Um, a little bit about the Montana Endowment Tax Credit. So the Montana Endowment Tax Credit, um, you get a 40% um, state tax credit of the charitable portion of a planned gift to a permanent endowment. So um, planned gifts um, can be annuities, charitable remainder trust, and then some estate gifts. And the typical um, vehicle for taking advantage of the Montana Endowment Tax Credit in Montana is gift, deferred gift annuities. And individuals can claim up to $10,000 in deductions. And so that's a dollar for dollar. So it's not a, a charitable deduction, it's a state tax credit. Um, and uh, 20,000 for couples. Um, businesses can also contribute directly to endowed funds in Montana, and they can receive a 20% tax credit for their gifts. And so this is, here's an example of the difference between a direct gift um, versus a planned gift. And so let's, in the pink column, you have, uh, a normal donation, let's say a donor is giving $15,000, he gets um, federal tax savings of 30%, so $4,500. Um, he then has um, Montana tax savings of 6.9%. He doesn't get the endowment tax credit, but his gift actually only cost him $9,465. If that gift was an in a planned gift into a permanent endowment in the state of Montana. The charitable portion of those transferred assets into that planned gift, if that was $15,000, he would get the federal tax savings. He would not get the Montana state tax credit, but then he would get the endowment, Montana state endowment tax credit, and he would get another $6,000 in tax savings. And that $15,000 gift would only cost him $4,500. So it's a pretty significant savings and there's a lot of people take advantage of this to um, grow um, endowed donor advised funds. So those are the big numbers, right? 15,000 actually only um, cost a donor $4,500. Um, I wanna talk a little bit um, about the difference between um, a few um, assets around um, both uh, donor advised funds and family foundations. So donor advised funds, um, they um, are a little different than the family foundations. Um, you can, um, the, there's a 60% uh, limit on adjusted gross income for cash contributions to donor advised funds and 30% um, limit on appreciated assets like stock, real estate, other things. And then, with donor advised funds, no taxes are required to be paid on the investment income. And um, with family foundations, it's a 30% limit on adjusted gross income for cash contributions. So it's a smaller amount and 20% for um, appreciated assets like stocks, real estate, or other gifts. Um, family foundations also um, pay a 2% excise tax on um, investment income. And they also must file a 990, like a private foundation 990 um, annually with the IRS, which obviously um, has some administrative burdens. Oops. Um, the difference in kind of like fund size, donor advised fund versus family foundation. 
Um, donor advice funds can be all different sizes. It depends on who you work with. I put $15,000 there because that's what the Missoula Community Foundation's fund minimum is. Um, we don't have any startup costs. So in order to start a donor advice fund with us, you simply just si sign an agreement and um, transfer the assets to us. Um, there are bigger donor advice funds. Um, for instance, um, uh, Mark Zuckerberg opened a $200 million donor advice fund at the Silicon Valley Foundation. So there are really large donor advice funds. There's no limit on the amount of money. Um, it's just a matter of sort of maybe amount of control that a donor might want to have. With a family foundation, and I, and this is like a national, nationally, typically they recommend 10 million plus. Um, there's a lot of startup costs to, um, that I'll talk about in a little bit to family foundations. Um, and there's also just the um, additional costs of legal filing and accounting. And so we do see family foundations in Montana with certainly with less than $10 million. Um, but um, sometimes, you know, money-wise, the better option would be a donor advised fund. Gift acceptance and investment options. Um, typically, a, a, a community foundation or a manager of donor advised fund will definitely take publicly traded securities, mutual funds, cash. Um, they may accept other gifts, and that really depends on the organization's gift acceptance policy and their willingness to take on risk. So, you know, a gift of real estate might not, maybe they, it's gifted and then they can't sell it and they have no assets to be part of that um, gift. Um, and then some donor advice um, fund sponsors, meaning community foundations, allow outside investors, investment advisors. Um, and so like for us, if you have a really large amount of money that you wanna transfer into a donor advice fund, we would allow you to keep your investment advisors. Otherwise, um, you would rely on our um, investment advisors for the community foundation and that are governed by our investment committee and um, monitored for performance and um, annually selected. Um, for family foundations, they can accept a variety of gift and it's really up to the family and the board of directors on what kind of risk they wanna take. And so typically they'll receive other assets. Um, funds can be either self-directed or they can be, they can appoint an outside um, investment advisor. Um, as far as privacy and confidentiality goes, um, donor advice funds offer a lot more privacy. For instance, um, you really have an option for anonymous granting. Granting, um, you could set up a donor advice fund and call it the do good, um, get better fund. And um, you could gift money out of that and um, whoever received those fundings would not, um, uh, would not know who that came from other than this donor advice fund that's held at Missoula Community Foundation. And then all personal information on the donor is kept private, um, including transactions. Um, with family foundations, the, IR, you know, the IRS is required um, you to file a 990 and a lot of information on um, your board and the grants that are going out are all submitted and, and publicly available um, through that 990 form. Um, and so there's a little less privacy with um, a family foundation. reporting and control of funds. Um, a donor advice fund is really easy to set up. Um, it's simply, you sign a, a agreement with us and um, it's like opening a checking account. Um, we take care of all account administration. You have um, you know, quarterly reports that you receive, um, whoever the appointed advisor is, and we're responsible for all due diligence. So that means um, you know, checking to make sure that the charitable organization is in good standing, um, and we take on all liability for the grant making. With a family foundation, um, they must become a corporation and file uh, by filing with their state and applying for a private foundation status with the IRS. So there's some startup costs, and you know, often if uh, somebody has a really um, 
a great year and they made a lot of money or maybe they sold a business or real estate um, and they want to set up a private foundation and it's December, the family foundation might not be the route to go because they might not be able to get rid of those assets in that year. Um, they need to appoint a board of directors, they need to have bylaws, um, and um, they're also responsible for all legal compliance and due diligence with grant making, which is a lot to maintain that 501c3 status. Um, as far as um, giving money out of these funds, donor advised funds allow, they don't give you any kind of timeline. You're not required to um, give out a certain amount of money per year. Um, there is some upcoming legislation that might change that a little bit. Um, multiple grants can be given during high income years. Um, a lot of times a donor might use bunching. So if they want to um, itemize one year, they give you know, three years worth of donations that meet their charitable deduction requirements. And then um, they just take a, the standard deduction the two following years. Um, distributions can be made um, for multiple years to the same organization. Um, there's no, it's, it's a pretty straightforward um, system and allows you a lot of flexibility in giving um, depending on uh, the amount that's in the fund. Family foundations um, must distribute 5% of the fair market value of their total assets each year. So any money that isn't distributed within that 5% has, is subject to a 30% excise tax. Um, and then furthermore, if let's say you give a grant at the end of the year, because you're trying to get rid of your 5% and that organization says, you know what, we're closing our doors and we can't take that money, sorry, and gives it back to you, you then could pay up to 100% on that undistributed amount of funds to that 5%. Um, you can, uh, a lot of family foundations utilize donor advised funds um, to um, meet that 5% requirement. So they might have like a sister fund of their family foundation. Um, and so they can, um, that 5% can be qualified as, um, a, can, the 5% can be met by giving a gift to the donor advised fund. Um, as far as legacy planning goes, um, donor advised funds can um, name individuals or charitable organizations as successor to the fund. So maybe you name your kids as a successor to the fund, or maybe you um, just take the annual distribution from that fund and it goes to a local charity um, every year. So whatever that just distribution rate is. Um, they can also leave the fund to the discretion of the community foundation. And maybe sometimes we have some fund agreements that um, those donor advised funds would, if nobody um, is advising those funds and they dissolve, that fund would go into our general endowment. Um, with family foundations, obviously you always need to have a board in place and successors and officers must be confirmed by the existing board of directors. And, um, you know, the board is typically made up of family and friends. So to get into some pros and cons, um, so with a donor advised funds, you know, I guess there, there's a few things. So both family foundations and donor advised funds provide significant tax benefits during a high earning year, right? Um, so that you get an immediate tax deduction. Um, there's no annual minimum annual spending when we talked about the 5% with the private with the family foundations. And there's high income limits and valuations. So that's the 60% of um, the, the limit of 60% of adjusted gross income for cash gifts and 30% for, um, for uh, appreciated assets. Um, there's no taxes on the earnings in a donor advised fund and there's low fund minimum. So you don't need a lot of money to start them. Um, and then it always feels good to support local um, charities in the community. Some of the cons, um, there's no personal benefit allowed. So if you had a donor advised fund and wanted to give and your cousin owned a charity and you wanted to give them money, that wouldn't be allowed. Or if you wanted to give a scholarship to um, your niece, that wouldn't be allowed. Um, donor advised funds cannot make gifts to private foundations. 
Um, and there is currently, as I mentioned earlier, legislative control being discussed around donor advised funds. Um, and then you only have advisory privileges with donor advised funds. So ultimately, once you transfer that asset, asset that asset becomes um, property of the community foundation. Um, the community foundation, I just can't think of a case where we would not um, take the advice of a donor and grant money unless that organization didn't meet the charitable um, qualifications. Um, so that's a, that's a very rare um, situation. Um, family foundations, um, pros, the donor has control over how the assets are spent or invested. Um, you know, they can use the same investor that they've used for years. Um, there is an immediate tax deduction similar to the DAFs. Um, they can make grants to individuals, which donor advised funds can't. Um, they um, can seek outside investment management where typically a donor advised fund is managed by the um, foundations, the community foundations um, advisor unless they bring a significant amount of money. Um, there's legislative stability and they can grant to donor advised funds. Some of the cons are that 5% annual payout required um, and um, the high setup and admin um, expenses related to that. Because it sometimes does take a lot and sometimes people don't realize all the work that goes into granting and accepting grants and putting out notifications. And um, you, know, you do need some staff time typically. Um, it, it has a lower adjusted gross income limit. So that's that 30 and 20% um, for 30% for um, cash contributions and 20% for um, appreciated assets. Um, you do pay an excise tax on the uh, investment income. And it's really, you know, scale wise, the startup costs that, you know, set up and admin expenses um, really um, deter, you know, smaller amounts of money um, being utilized for a family foundation. Um, let's just go through a scenario here and talk about my, what might work, work best for this individual. Her name's Sally. Um, she had a higher than usual income in 2020. Um, maybe that income was bumping her up into a different tax bracket. Um, she's looking for a charitable deduction to offset that income. She's really interested in charity, but she's also really busy. Um, she works all the time. She has a little time to think about it, um, and she isn't sure what to do. She would be a prime candidate for a donor advised fund. Um, the community foundation could help her um, figure out things that she's passionate, passionate about and make suggestions about donations in the community. Um, she could make those decisions later on in the, the following years, um, but she would still get the immediate tax benefit. Um, here's another scenario. His name is Frank. Um, he has um, 15 million dollars that um, you know he wants to use to give to charity over time, but also um, wants to create a family legacy. Um, his family has always been very engaged in giving. Um, it's something they do as a family together. Um, and um, he has worked with the same investment advisor for 35 years. Frank might be a better candidate for a family foundation. Um, it gives him more control. His family's engaged in the process. Um, and, um, you know, maybe he wants something to do in his retirement. And, um, you know, running the family foundation would be um, something he could do. And then he could leave a legacy for his um, kids to manage and turn over. Um, all right. So we're going to do a little knowledge check here. And, um, we have a few questions here. Um, and so if you go over to the poll and can answer those questions for us and see if you were listening, um, I'll give you guys a minute.
Okay. Let's see, has everyone put submitted their answers? Um, you are correct. A family foundation gets the 2% excise tax and investment income. Um, how much of the fair market value of total assets do donor advice funds have to pay out annually? Um, the correct answer is none. 5% um, is what private family foundations need to pay out. Um, so, and then what is the general minimum fund starting amount for a family foundation? And we had a few hundred thousands and a few 10 million. And 10 million is the correct answer, though there's many community foundations or family foundations in Montana that are under 10 million. Um, which of the following offers an immediate tax benefit for the donor? And you all got that right. So um, thank you for participating. Um, let's see. Um, so Missoula Community Foundation holds donor advised funds. Um, and um, you know, these are eligible for a Montana endowment tax credit, and we can help um, individuals come up with um, you know, plans and help them make. Um, decisions around how to match their pa passion with impact in the community. Um, and we can also help them engage the next generation if that's what they're interested in. Um, I am going to open things up to questions. Um, I do see a few questions in the chat. Um, and I do want to do one disclaimer, like all this information we provide today is just information. It's not legal advice. It's not accounting advice. We always tell our clients that they should seek counsel from their lawyer or their accountant or CPA or financial advisor. Um, we can provide you with information and to help inform your decisions and your discussion with those um, individuals. Um, there's a question, can you explain what makes, what makes it a planned gift? So planned gifts are something that isn't a direct gift. So the organization does not receive benefit right away. So um, a great example of that would be a deferred gift annuity, which is sort of the vehicle of choice for taking advantage of the Montana Endowment Tax Credit. And um, that um, a deferred gift annuity is an interesting um, way for a donor to receive lifetime payments um, for a gift now. So for instance, um, a donor could make a transfer of assets. They would, um, our organization would then agree to make lifetime payments to them um, for a certain amount. And that depends on their age and when they first start taking the payments. Um, and then the remainder of the funds upon their death go to the charitable charity that they name in that fund agreement when they initially make that agreement. In Montana, because of the ta state tax credit, a lot of people utilize that vehicle because at five years, we can say, do you wanna release those funds to the charity? And so a donor can choose not to take that, those lifetime payments, maybe they don't need them. And really what they wanted was the state tax credit. And so we, that happens a lot in Montana. Um, and so at that point, the funds would then be released into the charity's endowment, either a field of interest endowment at our organization. Um, it could be a family fund endowment, not a family foundation, but like a donor advised fund endowed agreement. It could be um, a designated fund that maybe is set up to give to um, Missoula Children's Theater or um, you know, a charity of your choice. Um, and then um, I, Let's see, other questions in there. Does that answer your question? Um, it does. Can I ask a follow-up? Sure. Is there any distribution made to the charity during the time before the expiration of that delayed, deferred no. gift? No, no. So initially for a deferred gift, it has to sit for at least five years. And so during that five years, those funds are invested. So they're earning interest. Um, and unless you release, unless the donor releases those funds and says they don't want the annuity payments, um, that fund is not, none of that money goes to the charity until, um, until the donor's death. And 
just sorry, the annuity payments, are those a percentage of the gift? Annuity? Yeah, typically they're a set amount based on the donor's age, their life expectancy, and when they want to start payments. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, and then you had a, can a donor advise fund that, that functions in multiple states, even if it's housed with you? Yes. Um, you know, obviously our focus and primary focus for our endowments and stuff is the Missoula community, but if you want to give to your alma mater or you want to give to an organization of billings, yes. Um, let's see. Um, you mentioned that a lot of family foundations in Montana have less than the minimum assets. Is this because they have been paying out over the years or has the minimum changed? Um, you know, I don't... I, I don't know. I mean, they could have set those foundations up with less assets because that was what they knew at the time would be my guess. Um, you know, I think um, Montana was a little late to the game with community foundations. And so um, maybe those some of those um, family foundations were set up um, at a, um, you know, a time before they recognized that donor advised funds were available. Um, Thanks. Yeah. Um, I think as far as somebody asked, um, do you know of any local attorneys that work with setting up the family foundations? Um, you know, there are a bunch of estate planning attorneys in town that could help with that. Um, I would maybe suggest, um, you know, calling the Montana Bar Association and asking for referrals in the area. That would be my suggestion. Um, Somebody asked, uh, what does due diligence for uh, grant making entail? And really um, part of that is, you know, in order to maintain your 501c3, you need to um, obey by the IRS um, laws. And so doing things like checking the status of their 501c3, are they registered with the state of Montana? Um, are they in good standing? Um, you know, and then we do some other things outside of that. So for instance, if a donor wanted to give to an organization that we knew was struggling, we might have a conversation about that um, with the donor or maybe provide them with some questions to ask that charity um, before they give them the money. Can I ask one more? Sure. What happens to the donor advised fund if your organization fails? Um, we, my board would ultimately make that decision, but, you know, most likely it would either go to an organization like Missoula Community Foundation, and maybe we would just transfer all those funds as they are, um, or, um, you know, a donor could, if there's still advisors to those funds, um, there could be an option to make distributions from those funds. Great. Well, thanks everyone for coming. And um, I just wanna encourage you to um, you know, reach out if you have questions, um, if you wanna walk through a few um, scenarios, I'm happy to have conversations. Um, my information is right here. Um, you can always call our offices. 